Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. I'm Rebecca. I'm still an alcoholic. Rebecca. Um... Thanks, Tammy, for reining us in to do this on a Saturday night. Um, so I don't really want to be an alcoholic, like, quite frankly. But the truth is, is after realizing at a relatively young age, after being institutionalized as a teenager and weaseling my way out of multiple inpatient and outpatient programs, that no matter what I did, no matter what combination of abstinence or substances or standing on my head or yoga or veganism or fuck all, like I couldn't drink or use like a quote unquote normal person. Um, So this last time I dragged my carcass into a rehab um, on June 11th of 2009. Um, And that was definitely a last gasp, desperation kind of thing. Um, Yeah, I, uh, I don't really know what to say about my recovery. I mean, it still trips me out that it's been over a decade since I had any kind of drug or any bit of alcohol in my system because I was definitely one of those people that could not function without something to like create a buffer between me and the world. Um, my little safety blankie as I called it. Um, and I don't understand why this like weird group of misfit toys has been able to like get me through so many ups and downs in my life. Um, I have gotten married in recovery. I'm getting divorced in recovery. I've opened a business. I've bought a house. I've lost a house. I've, you know, seen friends recover. I've seen friends die. I, I don't know that there's very much that this program couldn't support me through. Um, I know when I came into the rooms in my twenties that I had a lot of caveats to my recovery like a lot of well if blah 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 happened then I could definitely get loaded um we used to make up like different scenarios like well what about the zombie apocalypse or you know what about this or that or what if I had a leg amputated or fucking whatever and you know what I know people who have had limbs amputated and they're still sober so I have no real excuse like When I came back in like 10 and a half, almost 11 years ago, like I had so little left, like there was nothing inside of me anymore. Um, And while a lot of boundaries hadn't been crossed, a lot of things, you know, hadn't been taken off my list, I was just left with nothing. You know, my life had gone from what I had built up in my mind as like, party central and had this like horrible ego around my drinking and using and, um, I was just a really fucking abusive person and my life had become so tiny. I was in a room living in this like weird ass, what do we call it? Winchester mystery house in San Francisco of other drug addicts and alcoholics and drug dealers. And my entire existence just revolved around getting loaded. I wasn't allowed to see my family or I I could see them, but I did not have a key to their house because I had stolen too many things from them. Um, I could not be trusted. I don't understand how I was still employable and my mental health had deteriorated to the point where I later found out from my mother and my partner at the time that they were just waiting for the phone call that I had either killed myself, gotten into a horrible crash or finally ended up in jail where I belonged. Um, and it wasn't an epiphany. It wasn't like, you know, a burning bush or something crazy like that. It was just the end of the road for me. I, I don't understand why I got this chance, but it's definitely one of those things where I look back and I'm like, that's a total higher power situation. Like there is no reason why I'm not dead or in jail for the kind of shit that I pulled for over half of my life. Um, 
And when I have strange ongoing crises of faith, which still happens to me constantly, I have to remember that kind of stuff. Um, right now, or well, for the foreseeable time, I have been working with my sponsor. And yes, I have a sponsor who knows that she's my sponsor. Mm -hmm. I'm currently w working with one woman right now on her steps. And she has me doing the third and 11th step pretty much religiously because I still struggle with myself. Well, I still struggle with this concept that I'm not going to be taken care of, that if I'm not in control, everything's going to be fucked. But the truth is when I was in control, quote unquote, for so many years, like I was a fucking flaming dumpster fire. I mean, it was just awful. There aren't, there isn't enough time to go through all the horrible things I said or did or thought or acted out upon. Um, and it's that kind of hard wiring that I'm still really <clears throat> struggling with to this day that like from a very young age, I had really addictive, abusive kind of behavior with myself. And this program has given me the tools to be able to fight through that and, you know, to, to be able to look at why I act the way that I act and why I have such negative self-talk and why my solution to most things, even this far into recovery is still like checking out what it's not a question of getting loaded anymore. That's not something I really want to do, but my brain still tells me that that's a solution. <clears throat> But then I can also cross addict to other stuff. I can have all kinds of other compulsive behaviors that this program can also help me with. Um, and so I have to practice it on a daily basis. Like there's definitely been times where I've strayed away from the pack and felt really, really lonely because no matter how much my my civilian friends and my family love me. They don't understand me the way that you guys do. I've been able to travel to other parts of the world and go to meetings and meet other alcoholics and drug addicts that know me before I even open my mouth. They understand like the kind of sick and fucked up things that still happen when you have time, whether it's like a day, a week, a month, a decade, it doesn't really matter. Like it's still a constant struggle. And, um, being able to come into these rooms and to be honest about what's going on and to know that like, even if you don't like me, you still accept me for the person that I am and that we are part of the same fucking family. Um, it's the only solace sometimes because a lot of people just don't get it. They don't understand why you can't just have a drink or you can't just smoke a little bit of weed and why you can't fucking get over that kind of compulsive self-destructive behavior. So to be able to come here and to share and to know that like, I'm going to be okay today is like one of the best things that I can look forward to in my day. Like I go to a stupid amount of meetings I meditate really poorly. <laughs> I journal about nothing. <laughs> um, and I've met some of the most amazing people I could possibly ever hope to cross paths with in these rooms. Like the men and women that are in this program are my weird dysfunctional family. And I'm super grateful to be here tonight. So thank you. My name is Jesse. I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Jesse. Jesse! And uh, I love Rebecca. And I'm so glad to uh, share with Rebecca tonight. Can't hear you. I yeah. only get quiet when I talk about sobriety or something like super serious. Yeah. I'm probably the loudest person on earth. And then uh, my sponsor's like, when you're, when you're uh, telling the truth and honest, I can always tell because you're really quiet. Like, oh. So... Project. Right. I'm gonna I'm gonna give out a couple of numbers so that way you can think about those instead of my share. Okay. <laughs> so I was born in 1966. I'm the oldest of six kids. I got sober uh, July 17th, 2002, um, and I was born to two parents. <laughs> they didn't stay together, but uh, it was a good thing probably. Um. From a really, 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 really young age, I didn't feel like I belonged. Um, something was wrong with me. Uh, and in it, a lot of it was uh, 
internalized, you know, like I thought how the world should go and I did it wrong. And a lot of it was uh, my parents probably shouldn't have had kids. Um, <laughs> they were uh, very young and dysfunctional. And um, my dad probably was an alcoholic, but uh, he stopped drinking and became a rageaholic. And uh, my mom, uh, if you told me he was this when I was a kid, I wouldn't have believed you. My mom had uh, mental issues. And uh, people would say things, and I would defend my mom, right? I'm a mama's boy. Um, they go. My mom had my back during the worst times of my life. And so you could never say anything bad about my mom. Um, so uh, my parents divorced when I was like, I'm going to say six or seven. Um, my mom married a man. And I should say, my dad is like 6'3". My mom was like 5'5". Five, five. So when my mom got remarried, she married somebody who was also 5'5". Five, five, so it was a little weird for us. Um, but uh, uh, when we, they got married, and it was really weird because I grew up in uh, Oklahoma. And so I'd never seen people from other races that much. We had a couple kids in our school that were African American, and I had no classes with them. Like I saw them from afar. And when my mom got married, she married a guy uh, that was from China. So he's Chinese. Um, and the people in our neighborhood where we moved into signed a petition to get us to move out because they didn't want uh, chinks in their neighborhood. Um, <clears throat> and we come from the Bible Belt, so we're real Christians, right? So <laughs> this is how we treat people we love. Um, so it was hard growing up and going to school. I so much wanted to be a part of something that wasn't who I was. I changed my name for a whole year. I went by J. Chan. Until the next year at school, they were, they told my mom, they called her, and they were like, he can't do that. <laughs> you know, he, he just changed his own name, and he writes it on his papers, and that's not his name. And my mom was like, oh, okay. Um, and and I, I was quiet. I was a quiet kid, and I didn't talk a lot. And uh, People would always tell my mom, you have the best kids. And my mom was like, whose kids are you talking about? They're evil. You know? Uh, my stepfather uh, has his own issues. Uh, my mother uh, didn't know her self-worth. So she always married men who uh, told her what she was worth and what she wasn't worth her whole life. Um, so... My stepfather was very abusive. My father was very abusive. Um, the seventh, my seventh grade year in high school or junior high, I went to the emergency room 32 times for different broken bones. So I spent a month in the hospital in the emergency room. Um, I would go to school uh, in long sleeve everything because I had bruises and stuff. One time, uh, social services came out. My mom said to us specifically, she said to my sister and I, uh, if you tell them the truth, they're going to separate all of us. So you have to lie. And we did. And 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 we did. Um, to get away from my home life, I went to church a lot. I was going to be a Southern Baptist preacher. I thought I was going to do, you know, great things. Um, I also played sports. Now, being the man that I am, I'll tell you I played really well. In all honesty, I probably was medio mediocre, like in the middle. Like uh, they only didn't bench me probably because there wasn't enough players, so I got to play. Uh, I, I can catch a ball, you know, and I can throw a ball and I can bat. Um, I also like one of my first outlets for me to get outside of myself was sugar. Like uh, my grandmother is a. Uh, uh, healthy person she's fat sorry so we're all fat but she she cooks really well and i learned that from her and i was like oh my god i can bake anything so at five i started baking for my family like in cooking and getting in the kitchen my mom could burn water so she wasn't good at it but i learned from my grandmother right so i would cook so i mean it was something to like a control i think in my life as i could control is all the time i could cook and so I cooked from a small age. Why? I don't know why I shared that. I've never shared that before until just now. That's so bizarre. Um, I'm really, really nervous. I know that I love a lot of you guys. I know you guys. I'm still nervous. 
this is a long share, and I know in long shares, stuff comes up that you don't normally share or want to talk about. Um, I got into trouble a lot in that uh, my sister uh, was very, both my sisters would talk and mouth off to people all the time. And somebody would say something stupid or put their hands on my sister. And so I would just walk up to you and throw punch you and walk away. And that was the way of me telling you to stay away from my sisters and, and not to. And so I went to school. It's funny, uh, somebody in this room I went to high school with, who I never knew because I was such a quiet person and, and a lot of people didn't know me, but I got kicked out of De Anza High School in Richmond. <laughs> and I went to Pinole, and then I got kicked out of Pinole for smoking in the bathroom. And then I went to uh, Richmond, Kennedy, I think that's it here in California. Um, I got shipped back and forth between my dad and my mom. My dad lives in Texas. And uh, so I went to two different high schools out there. Uh, they had really crazy rules like no sleeveless shirts, no shirts without collars, things like this. And I couldn't abide by that because I'm from California. So I showed up in shorts and like a tank top the first day. And they were like, you have to go home. So I just didn't go back. Um, I... Uh, I remember the first time I was playing sports, I was doing gymnastics, and they were like, oh, we're going to drink before before we go. And I was like, oh, I don't drink, you know, we're Baptists and blah, blah, blah. And they're like, oh, no, dude, you drink. And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> and, so, and so then afterwards, I, I went from being like this short, fat kid with like acne and greasy hair to being like as tall as everybody else. And I could hold a conversation with you and look at you in the eye and... I told funny jokes and people laughed and then I'd stumble and fall over and pass out and they would laugh even more, which was funny, right? Um, it was amazing. I was like, oh my God, this is amazing. Um, I did, uh, even though I didn't like and got kicked out of schools, I did well. Uh, I can't spell to this day because I'm dyslexic. I was in the first trials for dyslexia in California, blah, blah, blah. Um, <clears throat> but... Uh, I was super smart, and so I got a, a scholarship to OBU, which is Oklahoma Baptist University. Uh, I was supposed to go in two weeks, and I met a girl, uh, and I got married. And uh, I joined the Army because I knew my family would throw a fit because she was seven years my senior. Um, so I went away to the Army. Uh, it's funny because even in the Army, like, I, I did really well. You know, I, I take direction really well for a time. Um, and then left to my own devices. Like my wife and I started having problems. I would show up to PT, which is a physical therapy, or not physical therapy, what is it called? PT is whatever. Training. Yes. In the morning. I'm like jogging. Can you see I'm like running? Um, and, and the sergeant would be like, dude, you weak. And I'm like, I don't know. I stopped hours ago. And he's like, no, you smell like alcohol. Like you're sweating coming out of you. And, uh, I'm like, fuck off, man. You know, uh, and I, I tried to continue to, to stay in the Army and to do this. My wife and I separated. Uh, the police showed up at our house. They uh, escorted me off the property and told me I didn't live there anymore. Uh, we, uh, I moved in with a friend of ours. And uh, after about six months, uh, he asked me if I needed to be drunk to be in this relationship. Like, what the fuck are you talking about? He's like, well, when you get drunk, you sort of, we sort of sleep together, you know? And we sort of, like, you know, have sex and do this thing. And I was like, okay, I need to call my mom because somebody's going to save me from this, right? Because I don't know what the fuck is happening. I'm from Texas. We're men. We don't do that. Um, my mom's, uh, the army chaptered me out for being gay. My ex-wife told them that I was uh, sleeping with a man. And they came to me and I was like, great, whatever. Um, my mom sent for me. I came back to California. I thought, uh, I was, uh, I thought I'd sort of found it. You know, I came back, everybody already knew, um, there was no more whispering that he walks sort of funny or talks sort of funny. She also say, I, I sang like second soprano until I was like 17. So, I mean, I had this really high voice higher than what it is now. So it was crazy high, but, uh, I came back and, and coming out of the closet for me was was sort of amazing, but also like my alcoholism was like, woohoo, here's another ride. You know, uh, my mom being a smart person got me a job at uh, Electronics Boutique, which probably two people in here are old enough to know what an Electronics Boutique is. 
It was a computer store like before Apple, so <laughs> back in the day. Um, like they had cassette tapes that you put in there to play games and do work processing. It was really, anyway, so uh, they expect you to be there at, at 11 a.m. to open for the malls. 10 a.m. so you could open at 11 a.m. for the malls. And I didn't understand how they couldn't understand that I couldn't be there because, you know, the bars close at 2. It takes me a while to come down. I go to sleep at 4 or 5, and you're lucky if I can get there by noon. And they're like, Jesse, you know, they called me into the office, and I was like, you, you know what, I, I have to quit. You guys are just expecting too much for what you pay. <laughs> and they're like, okay, good job. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> Um, so then I went to work at Denny's because they could be more understanding. Uh, I went from making a lot of really good money to making not so much money uh, as a waiter at Denny's because I could be there at 3 and get off at 11. So you could be drunk at the bar and spend all night out and uh, recover every day. I also uh, started managing property for somebody I knew when I was like uh, 16. Uh, I met this gentleman um, at this men's uh, chat thing. Um, not, I'm sorry, that sounded bad. It was a it was a counseling system, Pacific Center in Berkeley. It was a counseling thing for young adults, and that's where I went. And he was a mentor there. So weird. That sounded so weird. So sorry. Um, so he uh, he had me manage his property, so I, I started managing property. Um, I went to computer repair school. I went to nursing school. I was a nurse for a while. Other schools that I go to. I went to a couple of other schools, uh, office management, bookkeeping. Uh, I couldn't find my calling. You know, he said, you know, property management could be it if that's what you want to do. Right before he fired me for being a drunk. Uh, I uh, went home uh, to Texas uh, where I slept in the living room because they wouldn't let me sleep in the room with my brother because, you know, gays, we want to molest everybody. Um, my sponsor just looked at it. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> I'm like a mother hen. I can see out of the corner of my eye. <laughs> um, anyway, so I went home for a while. I got drunk and was drink a lot. And then I was driving a, I used to drive a three quarter ton truck. And one night when I was coming home from the bar, I'd gotten me a little efficiency apartment, which is a one room thing where like the doors slide open and there's your kitchen. Um, and the bathroom was in another room, but that was it. Um, and I didn't stop at a stop sign. And I saw the taxi, and I was like, I will beat him. And he T-boned me. Uh, and I get out, and being the guy that I am, I'm going to argue with everybody, smoking, and they're like, put out your cigarette, there's gas everywhere. And I'm like, fuck off, it's not going to ignite, and blah, blah, blah. And, and I'm try like arguing and fighting. The police get there, and they're like, you know, we need you to say your ABCs backwards. I'm dyslexic, I can't say it. So I'm telling him, I'm like, I'm dyslexic, blah, blah, blah. This is back in the day before they arrested you for DUIs. This, so they sent me home. They were just like, okay, because I was only like a, maybe a quarter of a mile from home. They're like, drive home. Straight home. <laughs> so I did. So uh, they still filed a, a police report for drunk driving. Uh, I, I knew, I'm smart enough to know that if I do something, uh, that you'll let me slide. You know, it's been my whole life. If, if I show up and suit up for a minute, they'll let me slide. So I was like, I'm going to go to AA to my parents. So I'm just like, I'm going to AA. So I did. Fucking not for me, right? It was like craziness. This is in the 90s. I went to a gay meeting. Everybody's crying because people are dying of AIDS. All this stuff. And men crying to me just freaks me out still to this day. I mean, I'm just like, women crying scares me, but men crying freaks me out. I'm just like, nope. We're not doing that. Um, and so I would lie. My parents would give me a little cash to take, uh, go into the city. Um, I'd buy a couple beers, say I was going to AA, and then I'd come back home. And like, you sort of smell. And I was like, I need to go back to California. <laughs> I came back to California. I got my old job back managing property. Uh, went to school again. Uh, I can hold it together for a very short time now. I started... Uh, drugs. I started, uh, I met somebody who I walked in and here I am a big strapping boy with short hair and he's like, you're a narc. And I was like, what the hell's a narc? 
He's like, you're a cop. And I was like, no. And he's like, well, then do drugs. And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> right? They're attractive. Let's do drugs. Oh, my God. That was amazing, right? Like, I was like, this is the best forever. I can do this. I started working at a gay bar. I started bartending. I was like, my life is amazing. I had so many friends, people who loved me, would stop me on the street. You know, I'd go to the Castro in the city, and they'd be like, Jesse, and I'd be like, I'm here. You can start now, right? Uh, it, it was, I thought it was amazing, and I had a, an amazing time until it really wasn't. Uh, uh, my partner was a drug dealer, so they would give me jewelry. Oh, amazing. Say, I have jewelry. I work at the bar. And then they'd take it away to pawn it, and then the, I mean, this happened back and forth, and they would, uh, be in and out of Santa Rita, and I would get them out. I uh, wasn't sure what I was going to do. Uh, it started getting bad. We ended up breaking up. I was lucky he left me. I didn't was too stupid to leave him. Um, I had fallen into the pattern like my mom and let somebody else decide who I should be. Um, I met somebody who inspired me to do better. Um, and I quit my job in the bar, and I went to work at a property management company. And I held it together for two years. And by that, it means I didn't get caught for two years. I would uh, do drugs and rearrange our whole house in the middle of the night. It would be super clean, and he'd come out and like, what the fucking time did you go to bed? It's like, this just took me an hour. I'm really good. And he's like, shut up. <laughs> um, I became verbally abusive. Uh, I would yell at him and stuff. I wouldn't go home. There was times when he would wake me up because I'd pissed the bed. I passed out and pissed the bed. And uh, he's like, I'm leaving. I was like, no, no, don't leave. Don't leave. I can do this. Right? All right. You can go out. You can have two beers. Right? Mm -hmm. So I would have two beers. Shots don't count as beers, right? So, <laughs> so then I only had two beers and a shot. So then I have two beers, two shots, and a line because that's not two. Yeah, two beers is my, that's the only limit I have on it, right? <laughs> <laughs> it didn't work I, I was really thought I was in love with this person I really thought that I could change my life for this person I couldn't um, one day I went to work uh, and he called me he said hey I moved out this morning I'm not, I don't live with you anymore I can't do this anymore he's like I'll be there later today to get my shit and I was like fuck off I'll have the locks changed before you get there and I did um I should say, the year before this, my mom passed. Uh, during my mom's passing, when she died, uh, she had 10 years before we knew that she was going to die. She had cancer. She came out of it. She had other problems. She passed away. <clears throat> I lost my shit. That was hitting bottom. And I didn't know how to handle life on life's terms anymore. I couldn't get up and go to work. I couldn't do these things. I did decide, because I'm from Texas, and at this time I had gained a lot of weight back, uh, I was probably 400-something pounds. I was going to go to the gay rodeo in Sacramento. Shut up, really? Okay, i got to get sober soon, right? Uh, so I decide that uh, I'm going to go to the gay rodeo because I'm from Texas, right? We have to go to the gay rodeo. So I stop up at the bar first. I, we do lines. I get drunk. Some things happened, I'm sure. I passed out on my car. I woke up in the middle of the night, and I was like, oh, I missed the fucking rodeo. I better go to Oakland, right? I need to go home. My my go-to is always go home. So I drive into the Secret Service entrance of the state capitol. <laughs> and they said, uh, excuse me, you have to stop the car and get out. I was like, ah, I made a mistake. I'm sorry. He's like, sir, you need to get out of the car. I was like, can I throw on a shirt? He was like, please. <laughs> please put on a shirt. So I got out and I uh, threw on a white tank top. We used to call them other things when we were younger. And Daisy Dukes, because that's what you wear to the rodeo, right? When you're 400 pounds. <laughs> so there should be an age and a weight limit on Daisy Dukes. <laughs> I think that we should put it in the label, right? You'll just say, over 25, do not wear. <laughs> so I'm sitting there in flip-flops in Sacramento. It's a warm night. My ass hanging out um, in my tank top, and they arrest me. And I was like, but... He's like, did you, have you been drinking tonight? I was like, I had two beers. And he's like, yeah. <laughs> your eyes are fixed and dilated. I'm like, I was had a fin fin. This is when the, <laughs> I'm like, I'm on a diet. I'm fat. Um, and at the time I was working for a nonprofit. 
in housing. And I was like, I work in the house, I work for people, and then blah, 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 and I'm just crying. And they're like, you can stop, because you're still going to jail. And so I went to jail, and I stood in the corner all night long, uh, my ass to the wall, of course. Uh, I don't think anybody wanted it. I just think that they were going to beat the fuck out of me if I didn't, like. Um, and uh, the next day, I get out, and I kiss the ground, because I was like, God, God did for me, right? And I said, I know what I'm going to do. Uh, they had impounded my car. I called my little sister. She was in a program. And I was like, this is how you do it, right? I called her. I'm like, I need help. She's, my little sister always wants to help me. She's always wanted to save me because I've always tried to save them. So she comes up. She gets my car out. We go to a meeting in Richmond. Those people, it wasn't my people. Like, I didn't see people that I could relate to. One of the guys stood up and said, you know, I'm not a faggot and this, blah, blah, blah. And, of course, afterwards, me being 400 pounds has to confront him. And they were like, Shh, go, go to more meetings, man. Go somewhere else. <laughs> um, and so I would love to say I got sober then. I didn't. I had to keep going to meetings and keep showing up. Um, I kept trying and kept trying and kept trying, but I could not drink. Um, some people here said you should probably go to the Castro Country Club in the city. It's gay people. And then you can quit being angry about being with straight people. I was like, I'm not angry. I'm sad. I'm just mad. And they're just like, okay, we don't care. Just go somewhere else. So I went. And uh, I met some amazing people. And they would say, hey, what story you want? And I was like, oh, yeah, I do all of them. And they're like, okay. <laughs> okay, so who's your sponsor? And I'm like, some guy that you speak. Mike, you don't know Mike. And they're like, no. okay. <laughs> right, whatever. Their lives were cha- starting to change. The people that I was hanging out with, and I was like, what is, what is, Kenny is one of my friends. He's like, what the fuck is going on with you? How come your life is changing? Everything is looking up for you. How come I don't have this? And he's like, I'm working steps. I have a sponsor. I was like, fuck. Okay, fine. I'll try this, right? I asked everybody that I had met if they would sponsor me, and they were like, oh, hell no, you're a handful. And I was like, oh. I asked people that I knew that I could manipulate. That's what the problem was. And people who didn't have enough time to sponsor. So I'm at a, I see this gentleman share in the morning. That night we went to a one-year watch for my friend Kenny. Like a good alcoholic, I sent my friend to ask him for me. He's like, that's not the way we do it. And so I walked across the room, my big, bold self, and I said, will you, you know, Wade, will you sponsor me? He's like, so you are... I'm like, my name is Jesse. Will you sponsor me? And he said, here's my number. Give me a call. We'll talk about it. I walk away, and in my best inside voice, which I don't have, my sponsor says, I said, fuck you, because that's how entitled I was at that time. I'd walked all the way across the room and didn't even know who I was. <laughs> yeah, an alcoholic. He knew exactly who I was. So we meet, and he says, are you willing to do whatever it takes to stay sober? And I said, yes, I am. I'm not doing a four-step. I don't share and I don't cry. But everything else, I'm good for. And he's like, great. Keep coming back. And in the meantime, keep calling me. And so I did. We showed up to meetings. <clears throat> and he says, I don't care. Just don't drink. And I said, all right. And I got like four or five months. And then uh, we talked about Lazy Bear. It's a, an event for big hairy guys that are gay. You guys probably never heard of it. It's in Guerneville. And I was like, I'm not going to go this year. I'm not going to go this year. I'm not going to go this year. And he's like, okay, great. Don't go because you know it's a trigger for you. So on my way out of town to go, I called him <laughs> on his home phone because I knew he wouldn't answer because he was at work. Um, and I went out. I, I planned it on my way up there. Uh, I get disappointed because the person I went to go meet was actually with somebody else and I wasn't paying attention and blah, blah, blah. I came back and my sponsor said, okay, you get one freebie with me. We'll work together. But this is it. If you're not willing to stay sober and willing to do the steps, you're going to have to find a different sponsor. I knew somebody that would call me on my shit is who I wanted, and he wasn't letting me slide and get away with, you know, I'm a cute kid. I should do everything. Um, so I started working the steps. My life started changing, and it was awkward, and it was hard. And there was moments when I thought, Nobody else would fucking get it. Um, we used to go to a Saturday morning and meeting in the city, and he said, hey, Les needs help cutting fruit. Can you help him? And I said, of course I can. And then 
he said, oh, Mike's now the fruit cutter. Can you help Mike? And I was like, great. After about a year, I finally realized that these were volunteer commitments my sponsor had just told me to do, and I didn't know that I had an option not to do, but it got me to a meeting every Saturday <coughs> for a year. I started making friends. I started doing steps. My life started changing. There used to be a part where it says, you remember when you say you are? I'm driving across the Bay Bridge to come back to Oakland because I've gone to all my meetings in the city like a good alcoholic. And um, it hit me. I was like, oh, I think I remember. You know, I think I'm an alcoholic. I think I belong. So I'm crying, calling my sponsor, driving in my truck. And he was like, dear God, are you driving? Hang up, pull over, then call me back. And so then I call back and I was like, I remember. And he's like, oh, we know, we know, you know, you're okay. We know. Um, it's funny when I was a kid growing up, my mom used to tell me that my grandfather was the president of AA in Oklahoma. <laughs> After I got sober, he said, I secretary the meeting. That's all. <laughs> it's, like, oh. it's funny how the outside world looks at us and who we are and stuff. Um, my life started to change. It became amazing. Uh, my, uh, I still have this a sponsee that I started sponsoring when I was five years sober. Uh, up until that time, I would have sponsees that came in and out of my life, but nobody ever stayed. And I kept telling my sponsor, I'm broken. I, I don't know how to sponsor people. And he's like, did you drink? And I was like, no. And he's like, then you're doing it right. He's like, it's not about them. It's about them keeping you sober. And they did their job, and they had to go on and do something else. So, Shauners uh, lived in a neighborhood where there was a lot of bars. And we would go to a late night meeting, we'd go to eat, and it would be like two hours before the bars closed. So, Sean and I would walk around his neighborhood, and he would keep me sober. He thinks it was me keeping him sober, but he kept me sober until I was so fucking exhausted after 2 a.m. I drove home. Once you start to sponsor other people and once you get the opportunity, it changes your life. Working the steps is amazing and it will change your life when you work with other people and keep doing the steps. It's weird to watch somebody. I'm getting a little gay goosebumps, sorry. Um, when you watch somebody get it, like it clicks in their mind that they're an alcoholic and it's okay and life is going to be all right if they just do the steps and let go. It's life-changing for you, right? Um, so in sobriety, at three years sober, my boss sent me to Mexico. I should say he hired me back um, after firing me three times. I'm now a uh, portfolio manager for him. And I've worked for him for 32 years. Um, he sent me to Mexico. I'm on, I'm still big at this time. I, I get on a horse. We go up a gravel road. It falls on me. They take you to the pharmacy there instead of the hospital. So I didn't know what to do. They gave me drugs. I was like, holy shit, I can't take these. I'm in so much pain, I can't take this because I didn't see a doctor, right? This is the rules we have in AA. I recall back to the States. I can't reach any of my friends in my program. I'm like, God, you have to help me. You have to do something. I don't know what to do. And so my thought is go up to the restaurant at the hotel and get food and then figure it out, right? I go up to the hospital, up to the hospital. I go up to the restaurant at the top of the hotel, and there's somebody from my home group sitting there. <laughs> and of course, I'm, three years, I'm running toward him. I'm still in pain. I'm like, oh! He's like, okay, what is it? And I was like, I have these pills and I don't know what to do. And he's like, well, let's read the directions. <laughs> <laughs> Follow the directions, Jesse, until you can talk to your sponsor. You're a genius. <laughs> you know, my best thinking got me here. My sponsor said, call me on everything. And so, I'm 17 years sober now. I still call him on everything. I've gotten the opportunity to go to Thailand, to uh, Cambodia, Myanmar. I took my partner and my sister, my ex-partner, my sister, uh, to Thailand. And I'm standing with an elephant holding it, right? We're out in the jungle. And my partner turns over and he's like, what the fuck are you doing? And he's like, having a moment. <laughs> uh, that was my higher power, letting me commune, you know, letting me be known that I'm just a small person here. No matter what size I am, I'm a small being on this earth. So, uh, how much time do I have? Ten minutes? Yeah, about nine. So, in 2012, I went to, uh, or 2012, I went to F.A. Uh, 
lost a lot of weight, decided I was going to enter a gay boy leather contest in the city. I did. I won. I was Mr. San Francisco Leather. Um, I taught a lot of classes. I started working at uh, kink.com. I started doing things there, meeting people who were sober, which was amazing, uh, doing these different events. Uh, I had a life. I kept running around. I had three jobs. I ended up uh, being in a relationship with uh, two people. We were in a triad. I'm a poly person. I don't do monogamy well. Um, my stomach, I'm just like so. Um, but uh, in 2015, 2016, what is it? 2016, I was at work and I was carrying a sink downstairs. I do property management. I slipped and fell on some cardboard and I landed in the middle of my path. And at this time, I wasn't really going to meetings. I hadn't been going to meetings for a while. I still called my sponsor a lot. I still talked to my sponsees a lot. But I wasn't going to meetings, right? <clears throat> I uh, had a trip planned to Myanmar, so I went. I came back. I was like, I can't walk well. I can't do this. I went to the doctor. I actually uh, crushed three vertebrae in my back. And they did a laminectomy, disectomy. They cleaned it all up. It still didn't really help. I uh, am isolating at my home, and it's going to come a point I'm going to drink, you know, and I uh, was feeling very alone. I ended up <clears throat> telling my two partners that they had to go because I couldn't take care of them because they were, I date people younger than me, and they, uh, I couldn't take care of them, so they needed to go, and I needed to heal, right? <clears throat> And I just know, and I'm talking to my sponsor, and I'm like, it's something that's going to happen. It's going to snap. I'm not going to be able to do this because I can't even walk to the bathroom right now. I'm pissing the floor. I don't know what to do. And he's like, we pray, and we'll talk about this, you know, tomorrow. So we prayed, and then uh, I get a bizarre number on my phone. And why I answered, I don't know. The suit goes, Jesse, it's Josh. And I was like, Josh, who? And he's like, remember? Oh, wait. This is the wrong Jesse, isn't it? I was like, well, I don't know. Which Jesse do you want? And so we go back and forth, right? And he's like, oh, you gave me a ride one time in the rain when I was a newcomer and blah, blah, blah. And he's like, what are you doing? What do you, you know, want to go to this meeting with me? And I was like, I can't really walk well right now. You know, I can't drive. He's like, you got a car? And I was like, yeah. And he's like, okay, where do you live? And so then he came to my house, loaded me up in the car, and took me to a meeting, right? And then he dropped me back off of my house, and then walked home. And then he kept doing this because he was unemployed for two months. He kept, and I was like, I think you're just using me for my car. And he's like, are you getting to a meeting? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, it, it started me coming back into AA, and being, back being a part of, and mostly being a part of here in the East Bay. Um. <laughs> And it's funny because every time that I think that I can't do it anymore, I pray and my higher power shows up in my life in ways that I wouldn't think. It's like when somebody says, I want to win the lottery. And that's not really the case. You don't want to win the lottery. You don't really care how you get the money, right? You just need more money in your life. So whenever I think that this is how God should fix my life, he does it this way. Um, he'll send somebody like uh, Josh, my friend Josh, is the one who came and saved me who now, like, uh, having a conversation with him, I was like, I would never hang out with you. <laughs> you know? It's a good thing you're an AA. Um, but but I get to show up today, um, and I show up for people in uh, different ways that I can. You know? I like to give people rides to meetings, because when I first got sober, I didn't have a car. I like to show up and people and make sure that uh, people get fed, because there's been times when I was homeless and I didn't get fed. Um, I'm also the only guy that I know that can come to AA and not have a job and get fatter because people fed me. Um, and, and they've taken care of me. And my sponsor and I still work together today. I work with other people today. Um, if you're new and you don't feel like you belong, just hang out because you really don't know what you believe yet. <laughs> if you're old and you think like you're getting tired of it, just hang out because you don't know what you believe yet. 
in early sobriety, they told me at five years, when you're five years so, sober, your head will pop out of your ass, right? You'll, life will, will make sense. <laughs> and at five years sober, I was like, hey, my sponsor's like, you're a little slow. It may take 10. <laughs> <laughs> so at 10 years sober, I was like, hey. And my sponsor's like, so maybe you should just stay because it may not happen. <laughs> and he's probably right. I really don't know what's best for me on a regular basis. But I pray, I meditate, I go to meetings, I answer my phone in the middle of the night because it may be another alcoholic who's calling me and needs to share or talk about their lives. I also open up myself and I tell people about what's really going on with me today. I quit saying fine, which is fucked up, insecure, neurotic, and emotional. So <clears throat> that people know that it's okay for it not to be okay here. You know, they said in early sobriety, when your ass falls off in the real world, Pick it up and bring it to a meeting. Because life on life's terms sucks, but we have tools now. We have other people that have gone through it like we've gone through it. Thanks. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.